to them. Children of the night, what music they make. Hello and welcome back to Scored to Death, the podcast. My name is Jay Blake Vichera, and I'm the author of the book, Scored to Death, Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers, as well as its sequel, Scored to Death 2, More Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers, which will be, or was, depending on when you're listening to this, released on December 1st, 2020. We have a very interesting episode for you today as I sit down with Jim Lang. Jim is probably best known for his work composing the Nickelodeon animated series Hey Arnold, but as a producer, arranger, and musician, he has worked with an assortment of artists, including Joe Cocker, Todd Rundgren, the Pointer Sisters, Smokey Robinson, Vince Gill, and so many others. But the reason why I'm talking to him today is to dive deep into his collaborative relationship with John Carpenter on the scores for Body Bags, and one of my personal favorites, In the Mouth of Madness. So, let's not waste any more time, and let's get to it. Uh, I would like to start off by talking about, you know, where your passion for music came from. Well, I didn't grow up in a musical family, but I did get exposed to some jazz uh, early on. My dad had, you know, uh, jazz LPs in the house, and... He was a Gershwin fan, and I think the biggest thing that happened was when I was in grade school, my music teacher played Rhapsody in Blue for us in music class one afternoon, and it just completely blew my mind. went home and I told my father, I heard this piece of music called Rhapsody in Blue. And he said, oh, we have, we have a recording of that. And so I took the record upstairs to my bedroom and I had a, you know, like a Hopalong Cassidy mono record player in my bedroom. And I, I just absolutely wore it out. It was a wonderful recording. And I think probably, the, interestingly enough, I think that record player was slow because when I hear contemporary recordings of it, And even the Paul Whiteman recording, you know, the kind of classic recording from back in the day uh, with uh, with George Gershwin playing piano on it, it seems like they're just blazing through it. And this recording, I remember, is being very slow and kind of maestoso, you know. (laughs) So I was was already uh, sampling it at a very early age, I guess. Time stretching. When did you start playing? Interestingly enough, my dad took piano lessons, started taking piano lessons, in, I think I probably would have been in second or third grade, and I wanted to take piano lessons too, so uh, they signed me up with Elmira Knott, who was my first and pretty much my only piano teacher, and I was a failed piano student from, from day one. Not a good reader. Uh, I found out later in life that my eyes don't team very well. They don't work super well together, even though I can read fine. Reading music was really difficult for me, and I always just thought I was stupid. But on the other hand, I had a great ear, so if I could get my music teacher to play something for me a couple of times, then I could pick it up by ear and play it back to her. But she was on to me pretty quick. I realized that I was uh, trying to game the system. You know, I think I took piano lessons for a few months from her, and then in junior high school, I took piano lessons from a guy, uh, piano bar a jazz musician in Kansas City, a guy named Side the War was the guy's name. And he was the perfect teacher for me. He's, I, I went into his little piano studio and he said, I, I'm just going to play some stuff and you stop me when you hear something you like and we'll talk about what it is. You know, So he started playing chords and playing stuff and I would say, well, what's that? And, and he would explain it. And that lasted for a month or two and then uh, I got a part in a kid play And I had to do rehearsals, and then I never went back and took any more piano lessons. And that was kind of the end of it for me. uh, Everything else I ever learned or didn't learn in my career was uh, self-taught or self-ignored. 
So at some point, you have to make the decision that this is going to be something that you pursue. I mean, because you've made your life out of it. When does that thought that I could do this and I could be happy doing this? I kind of went back and forth from doing theater stuff and doing music stuff. You know, I was in bands and when I was in high school and I was in all the plays I could get in when I was in high school. And then I went to Northwestern to study theater. I was in the theater program there for a couple of years. And then I got offered a job with the Chicago Free Street Theater, which was a project that the Goodman Theater and the Illinois Arts Council did and started in 1969. I auditioned and got into that company and then kind of just by happenstance, I ended up becoming the music director for it because I had keyboard skills so I could play in rehearsal and I guess I, I could write. I, I never thought of myself as a writer or as a music director or any of those things, but at that point in life, Hopefully you don't know what you can and can't do. And so all of a sudden I ended up with these responsibilities. So that was kind of the beginning of it. Suffice to say, I did a lot of playing in bands. I really come, come from a band, you know, live music background. And in 1972, I ended up going out to L.A. There was a guy named Rocky Grace who was in Joe Walsh's band, the piano player in Joe Walsh's band forever. And Rocky had moved to L.A. and he, he was a Midwestern guy. I happened to see him in the Midwest and we played together and had a good time. And he said, hey, why don't you come out to L.A. and we'll, we'll try and write some songs together. That was 1972, and I moved out to L.A., and Rocky was working for this guy named Rick Roger, who was Todd Rundgren's manager. And Todd was going out on the road to promote Something Anything, which was the first album that had really kind of significant traction. You know, it had bits on it. He was being uh, managed uh, at the time by uh, Albert Grossman, so it was like a, you know, a big push for him. And I ended up getting a job as a keyboard player on his first tour. So did that, went back to Chicago, did some more theater, then went to Boston. Somebody heard this demo tape. I went to Boston. I had a manager, had my own band for 10 minutes in Boston. Ended up, you know, finally, it was, this was the mid-70s, and disco was happening. So any kind of singer-songwriter stuff was just like completely in the toilet. But I had friends from Boston that would move out to L.A. So they said, come out to L.A., and you know, we're making $80 an hour recording demos, song demos for people. So off to L.A. I went. And then I did, I played in bands, had my own band. that I toured with the Pointer Sisters and Joe Cocker and Juice Newton later on, a few different people. And then I got married. And so to, it's a very long ass answer to your question. But eventually uh, I got married and my wife said, so, you know, what are you going to do for a living now that you're married? And I had a friend who was making uh, what they call visitor videos, you know, so like you go to Aspen, you turn on the TV in the hotel room and it's the Aspen channel. He was making those things. And I said, what do you do for music? And he said, well, I, you know, they got these records, of, you know, mm -hmm. I'll get a needle drop for 25 bucks. And I said, well, whatever you're paying, I'll do it for less. And so he hired me to do some music for some of these videos he was making. And that really was the sort of genesis of, doing music to picture for me. I got had gotten some studio work in LA. I was doing some rhythm section arranging and stuff like that. So I was kind of pretty well committed to the idea that I was going to be a musician. There wasn't much doubt about that. And hoping to make a go of it working in the studio. And then when the working to picture thing uh, happened, then that was a, another venue yet again. But for, it took a long time for me to think of myself as being a writer even though I was writing stuff all of me, you know, good, a ton of songwriting and everything, but it took a long time for that particular life to go on. When you were making those videos, were you just doing like three, a three minute bed or a minute bed, or were you actually see the video and then score to it? There was very little actual scoring to picture uh, in, in that particular gig. Other things that I was doing at the time, there was a, there's a company that does, uh, there are many companies that do it, but this one particular company called uh, Imagination Arts, Bob Rogers Company, uh, they do like um, theme parks and corporate events, world's fairs back when that was a thing. You know, they would do pavilions like, you know, the Toshiba Pavilion for a world's fair or the United States. I, I did a bunch of scores for them over the years. And one of the first real good paying gigs that I had was they made a huge 250 monitor video wall 
back when every, every monitor was a CRT, you know, none of this uh, flat panel thing, you know, it was like this giant thing that's like sucked down all the power in Manhattan when they turned it on. But there was a, we did a, uh, I scored a video piece for that. And that was a pretty serious working to picture, as you can imagine, you know, kind of heavy geometric thing, everything kind of sync locked all the way through. Um, pretty primitive tools for doing that compared to what we have today. How did you meet John Carpenter and how did that uh, collaboration start? That happened through my friend Larry Sulkis, who was a Kansas City guy, somebody that I knew from my childhood, from grade school in Kansas City. He's a filmmaker and a screenwriter. And his girlfriend at the time was a woman named Margareta Schiappa, who was a, went on to become a big time trailer editor in LA. But she was the woman who cut that 250 video screen thing for General Motors that was in New York. And uh, so she knew, she and Larry knew uh, Sandy King, who wasn't still his, John's wife, and his producer. And uh, so that's how the introduction happened. By that point, this is, I would guess you meet him in the early 90s. And he had just come off of a long stint of working with Alan Howarth. And the film he does before Body Bags is Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which... Uh, Shirley Walker scored. So he seemed like he was in a bit of a transitional period music wise. Yeah. He did a ton of stuff with Alan. That was a really, uh, as I understood, was a, a great relationship for him. And um, I think you, you probably interviewed Alan. I know you interviewed John. Alan, I think would characterize himself as, as a sound, you know, kind of first a sound designer and a tinkerer and then, a, you know, a composer second. And I think John also, wanted to work with people who were composer composers for him in the, the process of making a film because he did so much you know typically would write his scripts he would shoot the film he would edit the film so by the time it came time to score the film he was beat and as much as I think he enjoys always enjoyed making music I think sometimes he was just like out of gas when he got to that point in the process and, I, you know, he never said as much to me, but, you know, looking back on it now, I think, I mean, I know when we made In the Mouth of Madness, uh, they lost their production designer a week before they started principal photography. So, you know, that's what we call in the business a clusterfuck, you know, when that kind of thing happens. It's really taxing. So I, I know, like, for example, with uh, In the Mouth of Madness, when I got the work print of that, they pretty much locked the picture, and then John and Sandy took off and went to Hawaii to just kind of get their brains back, you know, stuff their brains back in their head. And the first few weeks of work on that, I just did by myself. You know. And um, they were not the best communicators in the world. You know, a lot of things happened kind of like, what am I supposed to do with this? So... <laughs> So I think, you know, anyway, um, I think the, the experience with Shirley was great. I think he got results that he liked with her. I know he talked in your book about working with Morricone on The Thing, which to me is one of my most favorite John Carpenter movies. Whichever pieces of that score came from wherever, uh, that movie really scared the bejesus out of me. And, I, you know, horror films don't really scare me that much. But that one really scared me a lot. So I think that was, and as you said, that was a different experience too. You know, Morricone went off and wrote a musical diary of his impressions of the script. And then they cut, you know, they cut things into the movie, you know, based on that. What was the collaboration like on Body Bags? I'm assuming that that came first. Yes. Yeah, Body Bags, I think, was probably more like he worked with Alan, although I wasn't ever there on any of those sessions. But he would come to the studio. We'd put up a scene. He'd say, you know, get me up a sound. Uh, he'd give me a verbal description of, of what he was looking for. And I'd dial around with a sense. And then he'd say, yeah, OK, that's great. And then we'd roll the picture. And he would freestyle to the picture. And... You know, given how much he had had his hands on the product, he had a phenomenal picture sense for being able to just jam 
to the picture. And so that would be certainly the bed of the queue, if not the entire queue. And then occasionally we'd go back and we'd add things that were more picture specific. Always, you know, you're trying to find a balance between things that are super on the nose, uh, super picture specific, and other things that are more atmospheric and really don't uh, align with the picture that much. And silence, which is a huge musical element in any horror film. Probably the most powerful musical element in any horror film. Definitely. I think it was Richard Ban who told me when I asked him about silence, he said it's the it's the first note of the of the score or something to that effect. Well said. What's interesting about body bags is because it's a few different stories, uh, the music gets to take on kind of different characters. And in, and when you listen to the soundtrack, the stuff at the top of the soundtrack sounds definitely more of what we expect from John Carpenter. <laughs> As we get into the music from the story, like hair, we start to get a little more jazzy. And then the final story seems to be more orchestral. John has dabbled in all those kinds of things throughout his score, but for the ones that he worked on specifically, he's kind of branching out a little bit more on this one. I think that's true. I know that the performances, Stacey Keach especially, uh, I was lucky enough to do a couple of films that that Stacey Keach was in, and man, I absolutely love writing stuff for his performances. I think he is a a real movie actor, you know, uh, in the best possible sense of the word. The picture really sticks to him or whatever. The music sticks to him when he's on camera or whatever. But yeah, I think that the first piece uh, really is kind of essential John Carpenter. And the last piece was us sort of playing around in the big movie soundtrack sandbox a little bit. Too. I and boy, talk, talk about a score. But I have not listened to that score since forever. So uh, I, I don't remember a lot about what we ended up doing. But. <laughs> when you said that he kind of described synth sounds, I mean, obviously it has to do with the equipment and a large part of what we think of as Carpenter's sound was probably coming out of Allen because it was coming out of his studio and his equipment at the time. But the transition into the, the stuff you guys are working together seems like a almost seamless transition tonally. So you said he kind of describes sounds and obviously you're not going to remember specifics, but what kinds of things would he say to describe the kind of sound that he was looking for? My recollection is that he really liked a sound that had a really long attack and a long decay. So something with a kind of a shape, very, very gentle, you know, can't really talk about the bell curve these days, but, if, you know, a very gentle kind of a, a bell shape. So it would start very slowly and swell in and swell out. And then the other thing that he liked within that context was something that was in synthesizer parlance, it was velocity sensitive. So if you played the keyboard harder, you could get it to speak in a different way. So he liked to have... You know, he was a, he's a, a guitar player, so he's used to having an instrument under his fingers that's really responsive to his touch. So that, I think, appealed to him a lot. And um, the same sounds that I, the same kinds of sounds that I use with John, I use today. They're, they're kind of classic elements in the, you know, horror film toolbox. I know you just said that you haven't listened to Body Bags for a long time and you don't remember specifics about it, but per chance that you might remember this, I'll ask it. There's a cue on there called The Picture on the Wall, which is kind of a very intricate piano-y keyboard piece that sounds almost too complicated for what we know of John's. And I was wondering if that was something that maybe you contributed. Well, if it was pianistic, it's likely that it was something that I played. And if it was complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, just because I know, like, in recent years, he's been playing a lot with his son. And, and and I've talked to Cody on several occasions, and we've become very friendly. And I can always tell the tracks that Cody mostly wrote, because Cody has a very specific style of playing that isn't John's style at all. And this sounds almost more like something Cody would have written, and that's why I asked the question. Yeah. It's entirely possible. Working working with John was, he was always really uh, generous in accepting the stuff that I did. He very seldom said no. And the rare occasions when he had criticisms, he was a very constructive critic. So likely, if that was something that I contributed, he was probably down to have it. I haven't done a lot of collaborative score work. I've done a pretty fair amount of collaborative songwriting. But you always wonder in those circumstances, you know, what does my writing partner think of my contributions? And because I'm self-taught, I think of myself as writing very simple ideas and writing very simply. But I've come to realize that exactly the opposite is true, that people's perceptions of what I do and, in fact, what I do a lot of times is complex. And so, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's not really an answer to anything that you said, but it is the kind of thing that when you get way on down the road, you kind of look back and you go, oh, okay. I think it's interesting, for, obviously, probably for anybody. I mean, you know, both you and I work in more of like a entertainment art field. So, I mean, I could speak to that from my own experience. It's just like as you get older and not it's not even age, it's more just like experience and getting more work, uh, uh, and more pieces under your belt you know, at some point you do start to get reflective about stuff and in a collaborative, you know, form, of course, you do have to look back and, you know, you do wonder about those relationships and like you said, what those people think of them. And then you kind of start to look at your own stuff through an outsider's point of view because you start thinking of it that way, which, you know, maybe someone who doesn't, maybe like a, like a painter who just specifically works by themselves might not ever they might, but they may never take that view because they're not, they don't have to bounce ideas off of somebody. They may be the kind of person. I have writer friends who really are uh, self directed and would only ever want to do something that came completely from their kind of whatever their creative perch was, you know, where they were coming from. Whereas I think, you know, A, as you said, uh, filmmaking is an extremely collaborative enterprise. So you have to be down to change things. You have to be down to utilize ideas that somebody else gives you. You have to be down to throw things out, you know, really is one of the most creative acts that you could possibly, uh, possibly do. It's like just to take something and, and who was it? A BT wrote a great, like a, would have been a blog post, except for I think it was back before there were blogs, but he was talking about his creative process. And he said, if I, if I start on something and if I have a fragment of doubt, if I have a moment's doubt, I'm going to, I'm going to throw that away or throw it to the side and start working on something else because you can spend so much time trying to fix something that has some indefinable quality of wrongness about it, you know? And I just, I thought that was hugely empowering. And it's something that I go back to again and again when I'm working on stuff, you know, early on in the process, if I'm, if I'm at all suspicious about something, I'll just set it to the side. And who was it that said that? BT, the, uh, he's like a beat maker, a major synth guy in, in the world of uh, synth nerds. I would really love to talk about In the Mouth of Madness. <laughs> in the preface of my book and it's actually kind of also in the preface of the my upcoming sequel to that book which is i describe the importance of in the mouth of madness to me both as a film and as the sound as a soundtrack in that it was the first horror movie soundtrack that i ever purchased is that true of my own oh that's so awesome (laughs) and i very much describe it as like that soundtrack is what put me on the road to now 20 plus years later as being a guy who writes about horror movie music and yeah. uh, it all started with that soundtrack so i thank you for that but uh, i would love to kind of dive into it uh, as as much as as uh, 
detail as you can remember. You indicated that you kind of started it on your own for those couple of weeks where you're not working with John. I would imagine that you're starting off kind of thinking about the kinds of things you did with John on body bags, but do you also kind of look at what other films he did for a frame of reference, or do you just kind of dive in and, and do your own thing and, and hope that it's going to appeal to him? The other films of his that I was exposed to, to any great degree, basically were the thing and the experience that we had on body bags. So those are really, they're kind of two, two poles, right? Two opposite poles in a way, because they're, they're very different scores. And I think because I got the locked picture from them and really kind of no further communications, I felt like, well, I'm just going to start writing, you know, and maybe this is all provisional. Maybe some of it will make the cut. Maybe none of it will make the cut. I don't know, but I'm sure as hell not going to sit here for two weeks or three weeks or whatever it was and not do any work on this project. That's crazy. I'm absolutely not going to do that. So I just started my typical MO for a long time was to write the score from the beginning of the film to the, to the end of the film, just go straight through the score as opposed to what a lot of people do uh, and what I've done more in recent years, which is to either start with a diary, you know, where you're just kind of writing free form before you get any picture or writing the big climactic stuff at the end of the film and developing the thematic material there and then going back and stripping that down at the beginning of the film so that you so that something that's huge at the end is a little tiny, you know, seed like a motif at the beginning. I always really just like to, to discover the story as I went through the film. And I think also, it, this is, sounds incredibly stupid, but there was something comforting about being able to look at the timeline and go, okay, I'm at, you know, I'm at an hour. I'm two thirds of the way through the, <laughs> so maybe I'm going to hit my marks, you know? Yeah. Cause that's always, that's a, that's a big thing when you're writing on deadline is like, how the hell am I going to get this finished in the amount of time that I have? So yeah, I think I started at the beginning and I don't, I don't even really remember how far I had gotten when John and Sandy came back, but I think I was probably up to maybe the last reel. I think I had gotten that far. I've written a bunch of stuff. I know. I don't, it, uh, I honestly don't remember showing it to him for the first time. It wasn't, we weren't in the days when you could make a quick time and give it to somebody, you know, or do any of that stuff. So I'm sure the first day he came over to work, we sat down and we looked at, you know, what I had so far. And then we just sort of picked up with our usual process. You know, we, I think we probably went forward from where I was and then we went back to earlier in the film and some of the really great, super atmospheric stuff when you're first seeing the, the insane asylum, you know, at the beginning of the film and, you know, they bring him in. You know, and there's that great scene where he's scrambling around in that great hall in the in the beginning of the film. That score was all John did all that score, all that kind of low pad, real ambient stuff at the beginning. John did all that stuff in the kind of traditional way that he did. So when you received the the cut, was there a temp track on it? No. Praise the Lord, there were no temp tracks. I, or or at least I don't remember ever hearing a temp on either of projects he said it to me but I, he said in other interviews that the the opening theme was kind of inspired the, by the fact that they used metallica as a, as a piece of temp music they probably did on the, on the printing press sequence and that and that piece of music as i'm sure he told you you know uh he and dave davies came up with the guitar lick on that And then the, the, that kind of arpeggiated keyboard thing was my full contribution to it. And then we sort of glued the whole thing all together. And, uh, Is that the only cue that had other players on it? Yes. I don't, think we, I don't think we did any other overdubs on that. I mean, John played guitar in uh, a couple of spots. Like Robbie's office.
yeah, that's the one where it really kind of stands out. And, you know, now that you mention it, there was, and I'm blanking on who the band was, there was Temp later in the film. There's a cue that occurs after the old ones come back and he finds himself out in the middle of the country in the road at the crossroads and is like back in the, you know, back in the real world. There's a cue there that's, that's like a, a delay. It's like a, a drum thing that's in delay. That was based on some, it was a pretty serious rip of something that, that they had in there in the temp as well. So maybe there was temp stuff at other places, but I've forgotten it all in the scenes of time. So in terms of the theme, for instance, you said that was something that he kind of worked with Dave Davies on and, and then you contributed on Synthesizer. So I wonder if you could just shine a little more light on that because that's become a staple in his in John's live shows now that he's playing live. And, you know, it's definitely become a, a fan favorite of, of his scores and it's got a great backing band of, of studio guys on it. There's a real tale there. <laughs> an embarrassing, kind of embarrassing tale for me when that cue became a, a thing and we knew that that was going to be the, the main title and the end credits. We set up a, a session to record that and remember who played bass. I know Mike Baird played drums on it. Dennis Belfield? Yeah, Dennis Belfield. And then uh, I booked or I tried to book a good friend of mine, a guy named Michael Thompson, who is super famous guitar player in LA who ghosted I mean, if I gave you a list of all the of all the you know hair band guitar solos that he that he recorded, <laughs> and that other people kind of lip sync their way and way through in, in a concert, you'd be stunned. But he's a phenomenal guitar player and somebody I'd known since very early on in my music days back in Boston. He was a he was an East Coast guy, so I thought, hey, it's this it's this incredible rock track. Dave Davies is going to play on it. But I thought I'll get MT to come and do the do the rhythm parts on this thing, and it'll be totally slamming. Well, it turned out he had to be on tour in Japan when we had this session, so he said, "I've got this guy, you know, I've got this guy, and he's great. You'll you'll really love him." So we show up. It's a film scoring session, so instead of starting at eight in the evening, we start at nine in the morning in Studio B at Capitol. Everything's all set up, and they have the green room set up for Dave Davies with shrimp and champagne, and it's like you know, it's like it's like a concert venue up there. You know, no brown M and M's. The whole thing's all set up for him. So we get the we get the band in the booth, and we get the you know the charts are all out and everything, and we're trying to play this thing down. And the guitar player totally cannot hang. I mean, and the rhythm part on that thing is it's just chugs, right? It's like page one of the rock guitar book. And, you know, I'm sorry because the guy's name is out there, so I shouldn't be talking trash about it. But really, it was, it was a horror show. And it took us, I, I think it took us about three hours to get something that we should have had in 15 minutes, you know, as a track. We did take after take after take. And meanwhile, Dave is sitting up in the green room drinking champagne, getting more and more pissed off unbeknownst to me, because I'm down there sweating bullets in the control room. Finally, he leaves in a huff. So no Dave Davies guitar parts on the main title. John and Sandy, you know, are, they're, he's a personal friend of theirs. So they're mortified, but they're not really doing a good job of communicating that to me. So I'm getting a deeper and deeper and deeper shit as the day goes on. So I get home, the telephone rings, and it's Dave Davies, pretty drunk. And he gave me the classic British reaming out, you know, perhaps you don't know who the, I am, you know, perhaps I need to school you about this and that, the other thing, and just really, really, really read me the right act. And, you know, hey, guilty as charged. I didn't treat him like rock royalty, you know, I was kind of breaking some of the unwritten rules of how you deal with that kind of thing. And I, you know, hey, I was pretty new. I was pretty young and I hadn't really dealt with that kind of thing before. So to make a long story a little bit longer, we booked another session on my dime, of course, at a different studio. And he came in and we were at, we were at Westlake in LA 
and Westlake is a pretty big studio. The control room in this particular studio was in the front of the building, and there was an ISO, you know, 50 feet away where the guitar amp was set up in the ISO. And when he was playing the guitar, you could hear the guitar acoustically in the control room. <laughs> That's how loud it was in the ISO. But he proceeded to, you know, to, to lay down all the guitar parts, the great, the great guitar solo that's on there, and the, the melody from that track. And finally, everybody went home happy. But I think that was probably my swan song with, with Sandy, certainly. I, you know, John was a lot more chill about it, but Sandy was pretty, you know, unhappy with the way all that went down. Where in the timeline of the recording did that take place like was it towards the end somewhere in the middle it was the very last thing that we did it was the you know the bitter end as they say <laughs> <laughs> that's a shame it happens though you know yeah and you know i i didn't come up i didn't come away from from that whole experience with great feelings about dave davies i was really mostly sad to not have a chance to do more work with john because i really like john personally and i think he's I think he's a great filmmaker. I love his, I, I love how under the hood he is, you know, and how in touch with the filmmaking he is as a filmmaker. I just think that's great. His attitude about it is really first rate. I just wonder if there's any other specific cues that you remember and like you're proud of. Like I also love the Axeman cue because it's so heavy and kind of industrial sounding compared to the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. The Axeman cue uh, actually is something that gets that gets reused from time to time. People use that as a temp in uh, in other films. I always really like there's a there's a cue that's called the Pikmin Hotel when they drive up to the hotel. It's a pretty short cue, but there's just the sound design in that cue, the weird kind of things that are going on in there, always really uh, tickled me a lot. So that was a favorite. Uh, Boy on the Bike, which is the one that's on my website. I think that's probably the best horror music cue that I ever wrote. And that was one that I did when John was in Hawaii. That all just kind of happened, you know. I also like the cue where they're uh, where they're driving across the bridge, uh, going into uh, Hobbs. Inn. I like that one too. That has a bunch of weird sample snare stuff. And then also for that film, uh, you don't really hear it a lot, but I made a ton of really guttural vocalizations you know that was meant to be the voices of the old ones so I, those are just kind of ghosted throughout the score but i i had took a big piece of 24 track and just filled it up with me saying you know whatever i could come up with <laughs> you know <laughs> I still, uh, I, I, in fact, I've used those sounds in a bunch of things, including in Hey Arnold, which, is, which couldn't be kind of more opposite. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I enjoyed doing that, too. That was, uh, that was fun part of it. Yeah, that seems to be a really interesting thing to talk to composers that have worked in the horror genre, because I don't think that a lot of scores lend themselves to that as, as a, maybe as like as a first thought um like you said you've used them but you know had you not already done that maybe you wouldn't use them <laughs> you use stuff like that and i also think it's interesting because clearly there was always a bit of uh, studio wizardry going on in music as soon as anybody could figure out how to do it but you know starting when things became digital and you weren't relying so much on tape or you could sample things and you could manipulate sounds in the computer. It seemed to open up like a whole new world for specifically horror film composers who could take sounds and really that maybe weren't musical and then manipulate them. 
Yeah, I, I remember back in the same kind of era, I had a friend named Mark Zamoski who worked with Chris Young on Chris's films. And Mark and I were both sample geeks, you know, back in the day and made a lot of, made a lot of kind of custom stuff. And, I, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Chris has continued to do that to this day, even though he's a great kind of a legit composer, he also is a, a kind of a sound chinker as well. Chris is in my first book, but uh, through that, Chris has become a, a pretty good friend of mine. And I love talking to him and like, he would much rather do like weird abstract digital, <laughs> you know, stuff, <laughs> but he just gets hired to do orchestral stuff. But his heart is just like in, you know, very weird soundscapes in, on, uh, in digital and synths and stuff. Yeah. Well, that stuff is, that stuff is really fun. And it's, you know, it's the kind of thing you can really get yourself lost in kind of easily for a long period of time. Well, like there's, uh, I don't know if it's the last cue on the soundtrack, but there's a cue called Madness Outside, and it has all these manipulated sounds that clearly aren't birds, but at times they almost sound like birds because the the way they kind of like uh, the pitch bend and 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 the, the pitch of them and stuff is is really interesting. Do you remember those kinds of sounds and and what those were? Yeah, there are uh, there are a bunch of a bunch of sampled string harmonics in there where if you run your finger really lightly over a string while you're bowing it, you get the harmonic overtone series way, in, way up high. And it almost sounds like a bird call. So there's many, many layers of that kind of really chaotic string stuff going on underneath. I, I mean, you can't even really say underneath because it's, it's just a wall of kind of crazy ones at that point you've uh, since scored a lot of animation and from my perspective they seem akin in that they're pretty for the most part an active way of scoring and you know obviously in john stuff a lot of a, a lot of stuff just becomes atmosphere but there's also specific moments and timing and of course, one could argue that that's an all film, but there seems to be something about horror film music that just feels more active to me than other genres. And it happens in in, um, in comedy, but in animation also. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the connections of those, if you have thoughts on it. Yeah, it's that, what's that thing that John talked about in your book where he talks about, you know, there's on the nose versus atmosphere. And animation is about as on the nose. That's where the... Uh, that's where the phrase comes from, you know, uh, from Mickey Mousing. <laughs> exactly, it comes from it comes from the from the Disney place, you know. And I think that the two, uh, you know, the the two genres are really closely allied in that sense. In that you are you're doing things that are very specific to picture at at certain points in service of comedy. In the case of animation, for the most part, and in service of being scary. In uh, uh, in horror films, uh, it's, something's going to go you know bump in the night, and there's a big you know there's a big sting when that happens. And so I, I I kind of feel like that's why those were two areas where I was able to kind of get the job done. You know, uh, I think things are a lot more song form now. Not so much in horror. I mean, horror really has kind of stayed closer to its roots, but in dramatic films and in comedies. The tendency is for things to be song form and for the music to be like another person that's standing in the room, kind of another character in in the scene. Uh, that's an it, kind of like an independent entity. You know, it's not really uh, Craig Bartlett, who's the guy that created Hey Arnold, said to me once, and I, I think it's a great met metaphor. He says, "When you when you write this cue, I think you're looking through such and such character's eyes. You're looking through Arnold's eyes. You know, so you're kind of." putting on your Arnold clothes and, and reacting emotionally the way that character would react. So you're increasing empathy for the character, et cetera, et cetera. In contemporary scoring practice, it's more like, oh, there's this other guy in the room who's got a great sense of humor, you know, who's got, got making this wry commentary about what's going on in the scene. Uh, and, and so that's a very different discipline for me when I get a project like that that's a dramatic project. I really have to tell myself to shut up and don't, score that moment don't hit that thing don't be that person uh it, it's for somebody who spent um, most of his time 
being really on the you know on the picture, it, it requires a lot of discipline to get the hell out of there. <laughs> Is horror a genre that you'd like to return to someday? Oh, I I love doing horror films. I you know it's it's a great regret of mine that I you know I haven't really had for a lot of my career I've represented myself, so I don't have somebody out there pitching me all the time, and I'm not a very good self promoter, so <laughs> that kind of means. There's a lot of work that goes by that I probably could have done, but, you know, I scored two other horror films aside from John's films, and I had a ball, even though they didn't turn out to be big films, nobody ever saw them, you know, but I wrote some really good music for them, and I had a great time doing it, and, you know, uh, I, I love that challenge of being uh, of being creepy in increasingly subtle ways, you know, trying to be, uh, trying to be very, uh, do a really slow burn and let things develop. So you've worked on some amazing projects that are beloved. You've 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 collaborated with people like John Carpenter and played music with people like Todd Rundgren and Joe Cocker. I was wondering if you can think of a moment within your career that kind of stands out as as one of your favorites. I always love hearing. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be the piece of music that was being played, but something about. Uh, your career, a collaboration, or just working on a project that kind of stands out as something special? Well, I, I, I can think of two that are the ones that really kind of come back to me again and again, and, and things that other people have sort of experienced. One is in, um, in the TV show, Hey Arnold, which is the animated thing, that, that Nickelodeon show from the 90s. There's an episode in that show where the main character's parents are missing. They're, you know, they're not in his life. He lives with his grandparents. And there is a sequence in that, in one of the episodes where you learn what, what happened to his parents. Or you learn the story of when his parents left and didn't come back. And the piece of music that I wrote for that is something that anybody that watched Hey Arnold could probably sing to you or could pick it out on the piano. one of those things and one of the wonderful things about writing music to picture is when you get a really great moment on film and you're able to get something that really encapsulates that moment lots of times you get one or the other but the times when they all come together are really a golden golden moment and that cue and that moment in, a, in, in that whole series was uh, a real showstopper for me. I remember when I was working on it, I was overcome. <laughs> so, and I'm a big softy, so it's not that hard for that to happen. But it was a it was a really incredible moment. So very grateful for that. The other thing that comes to mind is I think of all the people that I played with on stage. Joe Cocker was my favorite. Uh, Joe was the real deal, uh, and I never did a show with him where I didn't get goosebumps. But we did a show in Dortmund, Germany, and uh, Richie Havens was on the bill with us. And we played You Are So Beautiful, and Richie came out and sang it as a duet with Joe. And Richie's energy is, you know, he had his, he was standing there with his hands behind his back. He was probably five feet back from the microphone, just singing really gently. And Joe was doing... Joe, you know, he had all that incredible intensity that he brought to his performance, and it was just a phenomenal musical moment. You know, everybody on stage was in tears, and the audience was dead. You know, we're in this big concrete concert hall. You know, the audience is dead quiet. Everybody's so moved. So that was that was pretty nectar, I gotta say. <laughs> I of course would like to thank Jim Lang for sitting down for this interview. I urge everybody to check out his music. Some of the music for Hey Arnold just recently got released on vinyl. And of course, his collaborations with John Carpenter are on CD and digital download and possibly vinyl releases in the future. For all things Jim Lang, follow him on social media and make sure you check out his website, jimlangmusic.com. Once again, my name is Jay Blake Fischera. 
I am the author of the book Score to Death, Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers, and its sequel, Score to Death 2, More Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers. Both are available, or will be available, depending on when you're listening to this, on Amazon, from other book retailers, or from me directly at scoredtodeath.com. Follow me on social media at Scored to Death. I want to thank everybody for listening, and uh, we're going to have something pretty fun coming up in the not-too-distant future for Scored to Death, the podcast. A very fun episode. And uh, until then, stay scary. Stay scary.